ElectroCast. Hold music. You want to avoid it, and so do your customers. So say goodbye to hold music and hello to faster, smarter support with Salesforce. Make service more personal and agents more productive using built-in trusted AI. Then watch costs and wait times drop and satisfaction soar. Support customers in a whole new way with Service GPT. Learn how at salesforce.com slash service GPT. Welcome to the Nature Back podcast, where we are talking with our guests about the origins of the new green world. My name is Tarmo Virki, and in this episode, I'm talking with Joe McLeod from Design Agency and End. Hey there. I hope you're enjoying the Nature Back podcast. I'm Merit. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Single Earth, and we're a team of more than 70 people building a nature-backed economy. And if that sounds crazy enough for you, then join us. Sign up at single.earth to be among the first to get access to our nature-backed tokens. And let's talk more on our Earth Savers Discord channel. Enjoy the show. Welcome, Joe, to Nature Backed. Thank you. Thanks, Timo, and uh, delighted to be here. Uh, Joe, when I heard that you're an expert in endings, I was really fascinated. What was the beginning of the end for you? What was the beginning when you become really excited about the ends? Uh, so it wasn't really a, a sort of a, a like an inspirational moment, I guess, but it came about over almost decades. I very far back, I started to uh, I set a project at a university I was teaching at about. Uh, waste and rubbish in the world in design school this was and uh, all the students went off and uh, they came back with more stuff like marketing stuff like a mug that says don't waste resources or a pen and it did I could didn't really have the vocabulary at the time to really grapple with that uh, on an intellectual sort of philosophical level you know you could only judge it on a well that's that's more stuff as it were Anyway, that's, that piqued an interest. So I'd done a small project back then around closure experiences, but then I went off, done my career. And then a few years ago, I had an opportunity to uh, step out of the sort of rat race and my job and um, look again into endings. And then I started with death, which sounds crude, and but it is the most powerful example we have of endings. And then I started digging into it, why don't we how that's related to the consumer experience industry and and why we can't grapple with things like climate change and reflect upon that and that sort of opened up into this fascinating story which at the time this is i'm going back to like 2014 uh, uh, more like 2016 uh i was um really fascinated with it and you'll hear a lot of authors say it wasn't that i wanted to write a book it's that i had to write a book and then i started really researching why don't we do endings in consumerism and then you know like it was two years later i published a book about that and that was the first book called ends and that came out in 2017. Mm. the uh when you look at the kind of the i don't know the life cycle management of clients you always talk about the how keeping the clients is the most important thing and this is the kind of the best way to save money and acquiring new clients is so much more expensive and so on. But nobody really talks about closures. What do you think is the reason? I think it goes, it's actually a very deep sort of sociological reason and it's, I find it fascinating. We don't talk about it very much. So as an example, if we look at the a classic sort of consumer life cycle in terms of an industry or a company presenting that to consumerism, uh, to the consumer, we have digitized most of most of any industry has started really digitizing their onboarding experience. So as a consumer, I can go into their website and I sign up instantly and identity is created in the back end and the server's really good. And, and then I'm off into their usage experience. So whether that means a product or a service or digital experience, I'm in there. But at the end, we haven't done by any which way that's any sort of effort in the end to do the same thing. We still have really manual systems to say goodbye to people. So a good, in fact, a good example you can see on many uh, cable companies in the US or around Europe is that you can sign up instantly online, but to leave, you have to endure a one hour sales interview with a human being. How ridiculous is this when we've got 
I'm only going to put humans and waste salaries at offboarding, and I'm going to try and stop people leaving when maybe they want to leave for all sorts of other reasons than your product experience. Yeah, I've noticed that also. That the only calls I get from the telecom people is when I've, uh, you know, signed off from that operator. Yeah, exactly. So I've I've talked about this many times with with the uh, industry, and I I get sort of two um, bits of feedback, and one of them is just like a they really can't grapple with the idea of it, and others that have the ideas dropped in their business already and then they've they've executed something so um in my second book engineering which is a bit more of a how-to book about how to do endings in consumerism and businesses uh there's examples of companies which have done that so uh three in denmark is one of the examples there they've they had this sort of uh Sim similar to what I'm describing, they had a whole service team which had done loads of efficiencies elsewhere in the business, had some made the business really smooth. So they got a whole call center with like helping consumers do all of these things, they're hoping their customers do all these things. And they said, look, if we just stopped trying to talk people out of leaving, we would have so much more time on our hands. Most of the time, these people are leaving anyway, and we're just halting them so they created a really good offboarding experience which is in the app it's digitized as well and um and they and they've um and they, weirdly it was interesting to hear their their conversation about it because they're all they were when they released the app and the exit i think it's called a beautiful exit and uh they were watching the numbers thinking everyone's going to leave and of course it never happened like that no no any there wasn't any more people leaving because they could leave easier. Uh, you know, it's um, it's so many myths and legends around and it. it's sort of uh, fascinating to have conversations with businesses about it. Mm. But what's the kind of, they probably, you know, turn to, ask, turn to you as a design agency and ask for advice how to improve the process or how does it usually begin? Yeah, so um, when I when I start engaging with a, with a company, a lot of the time I have to do the the talk, sort of the uh, the presentation of why are we thinking like this? Because it's so embedded in all of our cultural references around business that don't talk about the end, don't let anyone leave, you know, we're in this forever. I actually, one of my examples is that I'm married. So, you know, I have a ring on my finger, I'm married. And uh, that ends in one of two ways, death or divorce. And in many businesses, we most businesses haven't even got to that point where they're like, uh, for example, it took um, Facebook seven years to recognize that humans died. The ultimate ending that bonds all of us on Earth as much as, in fact, it bonds everyone who's been born will experience death. Mm. So uh, we're so... Uh, we're so repulsed by the idea of, and this comes into a lot of the first book. Um, there is a deep psycho uh, psychological mechanism around why we don't want to talk about death. There's um, and lots of uh, aspects around that which have influenced into psychology. So there's uh, in the in the book both books actually I talk about aspects of psychology in the repulsion of death and how that's been paralyzing us to think clearly about endings in the consumer experience so the first book takes that story way back uh pre-industrial revolution because it's a relationship with endings uh so when we um and i'll come forward a little bit later but let's just talk about um deep history and the plague and the protestant uprising so i corner the story the beginning of the story really in northern europe because this is where the industrial revolution started and this is where the beginnings of that marketing machine started and the and the lack of circularity in the experience and when the play pre-plague there was a very clear relationship with the end most people were uh, a catholic religion they would also be able to renounce sin as they moved towards the end of their lives so you've got a really clear relationship with the end and then heaven was a really clear model of getting through that ending but then the play comes along really disrupts the relationship with death uh and then these new religions come along uh, protestants being the dominant one which dominated northern europe which had in the thesis that i've written in the first book is they had three mechanisms which were established our rethinking of endings which was 
um, fasting. Most religions across the world have a period in the religious calendar where you remove yourself from the abundance of life and then you reflect upon it. And we lost that in the Protestant uh, model. So we, you can imagine now if you if we all took like a week off and really reflected about our consumerism, that would be such a powerful festival reflection point. But because the and then the second one is um, jobs. In the eyes of God, in the Catholic religion, there was three good ones. In the Protestant religion, any job, if done well and carefully, uh, is, is good in the eyes of God. However, we've all embraced that. Now we've got career paths, which we think is attached to education and blah, blah, blah. It's actually very much more fundamental than that. It gives you an identity and then you feel like you can acquire things. And also a relationship within um, finance as well. So these three things then echo through centuries and the Industrial Revolution nail on those and then build up this relationship with uh, endings. So subsequently after that, we have a consumer experience. So if you think pre-industrial times, consumer experience was quite simple the sort of food on the kitchen table, the waste from that food would go to the animals, the waste from the animals would go onto the land, and the abundance and harvest from the land would come back onto the kitchen table. So you had a very circularity experience. And this is really important that we think about, when we talk about circularity and recycling, etc. we talk about the experience of that. And so now I, I'm rattling on a little bit, but I'll get to my point around, and what we've got now is this inability to think about consumerism in a bigger way, in a sort of sociological way, and particularly around endings. So an example of that with our relationship with circularity or circular economy is that we end up talking about material matter in that. So, hey, that would be better if it was made from these plastics or these type of tools. It would be great if it was manufactured in this way or efficiencies. Would. And we fail to talk about the consumer experience of that because the consumer isn't experiencing circularity. There's a massive gap at the end of the consumer life cycle that halts circularity. And that's our sort of psychological relationship with endings in the consumer life cycle. Is there something we can do about it? Is there something which could kind of, you know, not just one weird uh, hipster startup do, but le let's say kind of on a societal level? Absolutely. So uh, why I have to, when I go into a business, I do the talk first is to frame it in the in this in these senses that um, we have to rethink the experience more. So. We are really good at making consumer experiences. Onboarding usage, we can tell incredible stories. Uh, people are really acute, uh, 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 educated at reading those, uh, uh, moving through those and understanding what we have to do at each stage. However, when we get to the end, we've all abandoned it. So the end falls to the feet of society, like municipal companies to deal with recycling or... Um, even to the point where it is pushed onto the individual. So if you think about um, doing secondhand markets or upcycling, those are individual choices made by the individual to do better themselves. It's not an industrial strategy. So the industrial strategy has been left with the company that created the object. So what we need is to create consumer offboarding experiences within the consumer life cycle. And that's by... by getting the people that are currently doing your onboarding usage experiences to start thinking and discussing about what is the end like? What should it be like? And start reclaiming those materials more directly or having conversations with the consumer at the end so it's more bonding at the end. I have um, a load of um, models and systems that I've done in the second book. and that So the, the next phase I ever do with a business, I go in, talk to them first about the about the, the idea and then I go in with the models tools workshops learnings and I've run cohorts and um, lots of different training mm. programs for companies as well so you know in a way you know part of the solution would be uh, take the UX designers uh, from the universities and uh, you know add to their curriculum the uh, course and endings absolutely I I saw I work with quite a few design schools and I go in and 
teach them about endings and I run different types of things. If you are listening and if you're a university or design school, I do free talks as well. So you can get a free hour for me to like talk to your students online. But then uh, so doing the course is great at uh, college and university level and opening people's minds up to thinking differently. If you think more um, philosophically about what we do in design courses and many business courses is teach how to create endings, uh, beginnings and usage periods. Mm. And that's like when you come back from that, that's really not good. <laughs> Um, yeah, if you look at the overall world around us, I mean, basically part of the reason why we are in the consumerism, uh, I don't know, shit we are in. Yeah. And the, uh, you know, part of the reason is that uh, there has been no endings in the, in the process of all the products we are buying and we might yeah. not need them that longer than, you know, very briefly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I look through a lot of the initiatives that we've done to try and improve consumerism, for example, whether it's whether it's the um, recycling rates or um, or um, even even things like um, I read the International Air Transport Association. They think only one percent of passengers offset their carbon emissions, for example, through voluntary programs. Uh, I think I think that's if you were a business and you said we've only got one percent of our customers despite having <laughs> so this is despite they've got one percent of people doing it despite the legislation's in place, the service is in place, so the the mechanisms are all there and they can't close the deal. And then we see that with um recycling rates. The I think um today or recently there was a recycling rate um in the US and it's going down quite rapidly. And it, I in my belief so many of the mechanisms are there, but the cons consumer experience isn't there. And that we get all of these uh, initiatives, but we don't, don't build a consumer experience around them. Mm. I mean, some of the uh, recycling experiences in Europe have been rather promising. I mean, I got, totally agree. You know, the, yeah. the glass bottles or things like yeah. that, where the system is in place. The, yes. uh, in s some countries, it's very deep in the culture that I think Absolutely. over 90% over of the bottles are actually recycled. Yeah. And, uh, and um, if we look in, for example, I live in Sweden. Uh, we have a pants scheme here. Uh, sorry, mm. that probably means nothing to most people. It means something. But yeah. It, it, yeah. So uh, what it means is that you put a small deposit on a lot of different types of products that you buy at the store, whether those be cans or bottles or glass. And that little bit of deposit stays with you in the back of your mind. It's a great uh, complete con consumer experience because it has a proper, well-designed off-boarding experience. And at the end of usage, you take that, item back and you put it into a, a particular machine where i live and then you get a token and then you go and spend that back in the so you the whole mechanism and behind mm. the scenes as well has all been thought through so on every level this is an industrial well thought through consumer experience but in many countries where i used to live in the uk just no bother in dealing with the consumer off-boarding experience or building those types of systems mm. Very true. You mentioned the airplane uh, of offboarding, offsetting, uh, not onboarding, offsetting experiences. Uh, yeah. It's uh, it's one of the places where kind of main topic of uh, this podcast series and uh, and the kind of endings philosophy of uh, or teachings of your you meet. Uh, how about, I mean, the 1% sounds really, really little experience because you kind of have those people on board. They already pay you a lot of money and just get a little bit extra of, you know, good conscience or whatever the airlines are these days offering as a CO2 offsets. It should, you know, one should expect more than 1%. I absolutely agree. I think there's such a lot of opportunities in the in that space. So to back up a little bit and look at the whole landscape of the consumer experience uh, on boarding as a consumer i'm very accurately identified through my banking through any lo loyalty programs and i'm measured in lots of different ways in terms of what i purchase and whether that be sort of back-end uh, digital infrastructure of what i buy online all of these things incredible complexity around who i am and what i'm doing if we move to the end of the consumer life cycle in terms of impact, uh, I can immediately relinquish myself of anything that I've done 
as a consumer. I throw it in the bin. I recycle it. But there's nothing which says Joe's done this sort of carbon impact or this sort of X, Y, and Z, and it's attached to him, and he has to do something about that. And when I think about that in terms of uh, the incredible levels of identity systems I have, whether that be from banking to um, my identity as a citizen and getting access to education, and then on top of that, all sorts of loyalty schemes and social media are onboarding to drive consumerism. And at the other end, the impact of consumerism, the ultimate consequences of uh, carbon and climate change there's nearly a billion people on Earth who have very little identity. Uh, according to the uh, United Nations, they think there's nearly one billion people haven't got adequate identity, and one in four of those haven't had their birth dates recorded. And so when I look at the bigger picture, to think about the absence of this data at the offboarding, in contrast to what it is at onboarding, there's this massive space which we haven't looked at in terms of commerce, and when I say commerce economics, there's we've only just sort of touched off board um, offsetting as a piece of consumer, I guess, uh, economic activity. But there's such enormous space there to do much, much better. So coming back to your question about offsetting at the end of some sort of experience, there's we haven't done enough there, and we haven't even scratched the surface. I think of building experiences around this, which. Uh, like, like can drive up almost whole economies mm. around that. I can understand that for some of the airlines, it could be a challenge to sell to the consumers that you're bad to the environment. Maybe they will not buy the ticket in the first hand. Then, I I think there's actually a lot of people who want to have a better experience at at it, as it were. Mm. Uh, and a thing I think is very problematic is that uh, I travel a fair bit. I guess you know I am. All, Let's, let's say I travel every quarter. I Every time I travel, maybe it's on a different airline. And so I don't really want to like get loyal, not loyal, but I don't want to get too attached to one airline. But if I had a, another business which was handling all of my transactions for carbon or uh, offsetting, then I think that would be better because what it's really about is me as are the person who's impacting it. And I need to be attached to a company which is really good at measuring and really good at uh, really trustful in my identity. And that's essentially what banks do at the beginning of the consumer lifecycle in finance. We need a similar system of offboarding, which is about really good measurement and really good ident identity management. So I can, ident I can offset the things and and juggle the sort of uh, impact that I'm making in a really accurate way and mm. a user-centric way as well, importantly. Mm. So it sounds to me that there is an plenty of opportunities for eager startups to build uh, consumer solutions in this space. I, I think that there will be. I think um, one of the problems is going to be um, how we create an identity system that's more global. Uh, another problem with me measuring myself as a not having an identity as a consumer and a person that impacts the world is that that's never measured against people in other countries. So I, I find it hard to accurately measure myself because I'm always an average. So I'm an average citizen of Sweden and we're measured against the uh, average citizen of uh, Ghana, for example. And those, it, you know, it doesn't go that easy. I, I mean, I try and keep my carbon down, but I'm that is terrible. And I'm sure there's other people in Sweden who are really good at it and mm. and aren't valued either. I mean, in uh, Finno Greek nations, Estonia, Finland, everybody knows th that their neighbours are much worse than they are. That's probably <laughs> co that's probably yeah. common in uh, other countries too, right? Uh, yeah, I think um, that that's a common belief across every nation. <laughs> Yeah, that's the challenge of averages, definitely. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, you were earlier speaking about the Facebook and the uh, kind of uh, seven years they, it took for them to understand that people die. There are few companies which have uh, kind of started to build, you know, past death experiences. I remember talking to one Finnish company which was uh, working on the kind of uh, post-death, uh, uh, I don't know, social persona or 
the logic that uh, you can use uh, Facebook as your how would I say in in old movies there is sometimes uh, people put uh, video cassettes in the in the in the VHS player yes. for for younger listeners this is the kind of the old technology where you could tape things on the uh, and and you know maybe two years after the fa- father of the family has died they watch he what what did he wanted to say or maybe five years after and so on but they basically created the same system for Facebook or other social medias that after you pass away, you know, two years later or five years later or ten years later, there would be still coming postings from you, kind of post-mortem. I, I think it's a, a big issue, and I wrote about it a, a little bit in the uh, second book, Engineering, mm-hmm. and um, there's a really interesting uh, graveyard. Oh, I can't remember where it was. I think it's in um, an area of Russia, and the a lot of very rich people there have created these um, gravestones that are very photographic representations of themselves, but also have uh, consumer objects in them. And so they are very proudly, for example, gravestones that are 10 years old, very proudly holding a very old Nokia phone, for example. That's good for listeners in Finland, because we were talking, I used to work for Nokia. Sorry, me too. Joke between me, too. Us. me too, sorry. Yes. <laughs> so they're holding a really old Nokia phone or standing in front of a very dated car, and it looks so bad. And I think one of the things which we have difficulty with is seeing such a lot of noise in our immediate life. We see it very difficult to project a long way forward or a long way back and understand a sort of sociological context from that. So, for example... I think there's a very strong tradition of making mausoleum and mortuary type uh, artwork, but they would always also avoid too many representations from the current period. So the person is identified as a as a facial representation, a physical representation. And what we'll end up doing, I think, when we look at um, creating many mortuary type experiences in the modern world with social media attached to it, is misrepresent that person as an individual and we'll misrepre- we'll represent them through the objects and consumer objects that they have associated with themselves at the time and so i think there's issues around that which are really difficult to grapple with and if there is businesses that have um, done well in that space i think then they deserve a lot of respect because it's a really difficult area to look at I bet it's really difficult but i you know i can see their accountants uh, thinking about hey Think about those eternal monthly revenues coming from a client. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I do know some uh, like because obviously I've talked about endings for a while, so I bump into people, and I know of some people in uh, who've created businesses around endings uh, in terms of funeral stuff, mm-hmm. not just social media stuff, but creating. And there's actually a lot of money in in that world. I would, I'm not. Not so sure I want to get into that world, but yeah. I mean, eventually we all will be at least clients of those companies in some way or another. Yes. That's a good thing. Certainly. It's bigger than Facebook. Yeah. (laughs) Absolutely. It's enormous. In fact, Facebook is the biggest graveyard on earth now. It's 8,000 people a day die on Facebook. Wow. Yeah. So it's actually, it's pretty big as a a funeral home. (laughs) So basically, grave, uh, gravestones for Facebook profiles could be a business case. Yeah, I did. I did also example. Um, so Facebook have mortuary pages online, and so as much as Facebook took seven years to um, acknowledge that humans die, when you look at the mortuary pages, there's no user case that says we're going to remove this or shut this down despite maybe it never gets looked at and despite uh, you know no active users or anything and there's no timeline to it either these are quite rich data sources so they have loads of archived uh, imagery on etc etc and so there's also a point where if facebook doesn't keep its numbers up and it starts to degrade in terms of uh, user numbers and which is like massive now, but that's inevitable, you know, mm. all companies do. There's going to be a point where there's more dead people on Facebook than there is live people on Facebook. 
because they'll have so many mortuary pages that they have to keep running. And then Facebook will eventually die because they can't deal with the amount of dead people on Facebook. That's a beautiful future vision. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure there are kind of Facebook financial analysts who have been drawing this graph of <laughs> yeah. uh, you know amount of dead people going and uh, where uh, which year they are meeting. That would be a really interesting data. If somebody has a has a number, do let us know. That sounds yeah. so, sounds like something to you know get into. Um, so I'd love to know that. What's uh, you know going into the 2023 soon? What's your next challenges you're probably writing the third book on now on the beginnings right uh, actually not i'm i'm not writing a book right now the last book came out in uh you know 10 months ago uh right now i've been building for the last few months i've been building a cohort thing so digitizing the whole training package so that can now be um you can now sign up to that online you can go to the and end.co website and then go from there to the cohort learning uh pages and that goes on every uh, couple of months i run that and that's been really good and it's a great opportunity for people to they go through all of the syllabus and then we meet up once a week and have these fascinating conversations about endings and uh, consumer experience a lot of it is around um, environmental stuff we do talk also about digital endings and service endings so it's for anyone who's interested in consumerism and uh, building a better consumer experience and especially around uh, not impacting the earth. Mm. So uh, I've been working on that and then um, building up the um, business side, so uh, building up the client base. So I've got, I mean, you can go on the website, but I've got some great clients already, world-class clients, car mm. companies, big uh, tech companies all over the world. Uh, I don't travel so much now, but most of the training's online. So mm. uh, I do, a, I work for some of the biggest companies mm. on earth. Uh, the beauty of the 21st century, we can put it all on Earth and uh, at least save the climate a little bit by not traveling. Oh, it's been amazing on that level. I think mm. it's really helped a lot of people manage businesses as well. Exactly. And, Great. you know, we are recording this podcast over Zoom like uh, many other podcasts I've recorded. So the technology works. Yes, it's great. Beautiful. Thank you, Joe, for this uh, chat We'll Thanks ever so much, Tamo. It's been so nice to chat to you and uh, to share the endings, engineering stuff. Good. And I'm sure it's just the beginning for all of us. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> okay. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Join us again for the next episode. Thank you for listening. If you like the show, please give us a good rating and leave the feedback in your podcast player so others will find it too. We will be back next week. Turn on to Nature Back Podcast. Welcome to the Candle Power Hour. Come with us backstage behind the scenes of show business spanning over four decades and bringing you the experiences that can only be told by the people who were there. Our guests are from the A-list, the F-list, and everyone in between. Get set for some of the most insane, hilarious, and inspiring stories you will ever hear. I'm Mercury. And I'm Diego. Your host for the, the Candle, Candle Power, Power Hour. Hour. I could tell she was a dame who normally knew what she wanted. I'm looking for something interesting. But when it came to podcasts, she was lost in a fog. That's where I come in. The name's Guide, Podcast Guide. I'm the community search engine for podcasts, and I knew I could help her navigate the murky waters of podcasting and find the shows that fit her style. Can you keep it down? A girl's trying to listen to a podcast here. Head to www.podcastguide.us and let's solve this mystery together. Electric acid.